Thank you very much. Um, I'm speaking mainly about the Australian economy, but I thought I'd just put up a, uh, an opening slide anyway about where we see the world. And compared to what Karen's just said, uh, we're very similar. Um, in the short term, we're talking about 3.5% growth this year. Um, we're basically saying that Europe has stopped falling. We're not expecting a lot of growth. Um, UK is looking reasonably strong at present. US, I think, uh, and you have to be always careful, of course, of uh, things like the weather at present. It's very difficult to in, sort of understand what's going on. But generally, I think the US has the potential to upside. Um, Japan, I'm sort of worried about. I think that's very much a sugar hit. And China, um, we're expecting about 7.5% this year and around 7 in the medium term. And I would also say that 7 is um, when you're the second biggest economy in the world is actually very large. And the throwaway line we typically use is that China at 7 is basically generating a new career every two and a bit years. So there'll be a large demand. Um, I'm going to move then on to the domestic, and, and in the medium term, we also expect a return to trend growth. I'm a little bit more nervous about the emerging markets because some of those, particularly Brazil, Argentina and India, are misfiring at present. On the currency, um, we just try and get the next 12 to 18 months roughly right. Um, this is a model that we run, um, and you can have a look at the slides later on, but basically it's driven by things like commodity prices, uh, how weak is the US dollar, uh, rates, relative levels of unemployment or GDP, and, and things like equities, and, and a particularly one that's important is the VIX, which is risk on, risk off. The current, and the two red lines there are basically the um, standard errors of the model, plus or minus five cents, so it's not a forecasting model, it's a sort of fundamental model. The model today says the currency is worth 20, uh, about 92 cents. Um, we expect commodity prices to continue to track down. There's a lot of shorting of the Aussie, um, but in a fundamental sense, we expect somewhere around about 84 by the end of this year and somewhere around about 80 uh, into the medium term. Uh, we're, like Abair, we're not expecting the Australian dollar to go back to long-term averages in the 70s. I think there's a fundamental difference in terms of where the world economy is and the demand for Australian commodities. Okay, so with that, I'm going to talk then about Australia. Um, a couple of themes I'm going to be picking up on is where is the economy now? Are we approaching a turning point? Um, we have had some better data recently. Um, will those better pieces of data be um, maintained? And I think it varies when you're looking at consumers. And ha Consumers, I think, clearly are starting to turn. Housing, I can see signs of it. Uh, business investment in the labour market, I'm still worried. The, the key challenge, if you're thinking about the Australian economy, is not whether we're going to have a big slowdown in growth. That's not going to happen in a fundamental sense. Because what's going to happen is you're now moving from essentially the investment phase of the mining boom into the export phase. And so if you think about it this way, the Australian economy gets plus 2% from exports for the next five to 10 years. So you've got to do something really bad to get it below zero. The real issue, however, is as the exports continue to grow, the miners are going to be investing less. And so therefore, from a domestic point of view, the domestic part of the economy, which we all live in, um, basically will the non-mining parts of the economy pick up the slack that's going to be generated by that mining sector. And there I'm a little bit more concerned. So if I move on to the um, next slide, this is the sort of, we, we run business confidence and business conditions uh, results that you hear about. The red line is business confidence and that kick uh, was around the time of the election. So for better or worse, business thought the change of government was gonna make life a bit better for them. Business activity, in other words, how did you really go rather than how, how do you think you're going to go, didn't do very much. Um, and it basically, in the last month or so, has started to get above the zero line. So it's not quite yet at, at uh, the trend line, which is around where that dotted line is there, but it's getting there. 
So there's been some big recoveries in terms of confidence and now it's starting to show up a bit in actual activity. If you look at um, by sector, red is confidence. And so just about all sectors are doing reasonably well. Blue is conditions. Think of the zero line as roughly trend growth. The big positive I would like to draw out is about the third one in, which is recreation and personal services. That is the consumer buying services. It's about 30% of the economy. And if you have to have one part of the economy doing well, that's the bit I'd like to have doing well. So the Australian consumer has a job, has money, and if they think they need to do something, i.e. see the doctor, buy their education fees, etc., etc., they will. There are still difficulties in mining in terms of the slowdown, um, particularly mining services, utilities, transport, wholesale, and manufacturing is actually doing better recently, but whether that's going to be sustained is another issue. So there are some positives there in terms of growth, but it's still multi-speed. In terms of consumers, they are still on the left-hand side saving almost as much money as they did at the time that Lehman Brothers fell over. And so they are still very conservative. And the right-hand side says when we ask business or consumers about um, what's causing them problems, always cost of living. And so we've asked them a whole pile of things there about what's your problem? What's the thing that's making you sort of nervous about the cost of living? And what you see is utility fees, you see education costs, you see housing costs, you see financing. In other words, these are things that people think are non-discretionary. They don't worry about the fact of travel costs. They don't worry about keeping up with the Joneses. It's more about these are things I have to do and they're expensive. So consumers are still guarded, I suppose, is the best way to describe it. So recent evidence on consumers is fairly positive. Left-hand side there is basically retail sales against our business survey. And business survey is saying business condition is picking up. The right-hand side is looking at online retail, which is currently growing at around 12 to 13%. If you look at the black line there, that gives you the context. Black is online, red is, is sort of traditional. So even though the traditional is picking up a bit, the online is much stronger. And in the last couple of months, it started to pick up again. So consumer does look like it's picking up. Part of the story is liquidity. Part of the story is basically house prices. And one of the transmission mechanisms of low interest rates is essentially you increase house prices. The left-hand side graph is property, is property expectations coming from our survey of uh, about 500 professionals in the market. And the right-hand side gives our view about what's going to happen. So uh, we're basically expecting house prices to be around 6% up this year. Um, it's coming off, and the reason it's coming off in terms of the growth rates, are basically we expect unemployment to continue to, de to deteriorate. The one reason, uh, when we ask the business um, people out there, they give us a growth forecast of 4% on house prices, which we think is a bit low. One chart that I think is interesting that's very hard to get data on is what, what's happening in terms of foreign investment in housing, and particularly in apartments, which is in red. Um, so we're seeing a lot of interest in China as the crackdown goes on, on uh, housing over there of buying apartments in Australia. So the red line tells you around about 11 to 12 per cent of professionals tell me that they're buying, they're selling an apartment to essentially a foreigner, mainly Chinese and Asians. Um, and there's a lower stock. Now you can argue about whether it's right or not in terms of those levels. Um, the anecdotal evidence I get in a bank is that it's probably too low. Um, but whatever it was, three or four years ago, it's double now. That's what that chart's telling you. So we think that's helping a bit. The other area on the left-hand side is building approvals. And what we're seeing there in the red is a massive hike up in the number of apartments that are built in Australia. If you go back 20 years ago, for every uh, one apartment, there was basically four houses built. Now they're almost the same. And what the chart on the right-hand side says is if you build more approvals, uh, eventually you're going to actually build them. And therefore you're going to get an increase in investment in dwellings. 
Hasn't happened yet, won't happen in the national accounts tomorrow because we've got the parcels, they went backwards again. We think it will happen. So the surprise has been that you've had these big increases in approvals, but it hasn't actually started yet. But if you're sitting back and taking a bet, you'd say that the construction sector in Australia is gonna pick up. So, um, as I said, this is sort of a summary. They're very, uh, the, the adjustment process is the critical issue. Um, we've seen some traction in terms of consumers. We've seen some traction in terms of building approvals. Unfortunately, we're not seeing anything in terms of non-mining investment, which is important. To give you a, a sort of a scale of what we're talking about in the slowdown in mining investment, so th not the contribution to GDP, but investment, the blue line on the left-hand side there shows mining investment as a percent of GDP. It used to be 10 years ago, 1% of GDP is now up to about 8%. Now, there's still going to be a lot of mining investment going on, but we think it's going to go from 8% to 4% as you go forward. And it, what you're seeing in the capital expenditure plans is that's going to happen. The right-hand side um, is really our estimate of how much mining employment is actually being generated by building new mines, which is in red. So there's no official data for this. We use input-output data to try and get an estimate of it. And then as the mines are sort of built and then start to operate, you don't need the people to build the mines anymore. And over the next 12 to 18 months, we're talking about 100,000 jobs less. So that's a significant negative headwind. And although there's a lot of spaghetti in this graph, this is basically capacity utilisation in some of the key sectors. It's including in mining, but generally what we're seeing in the non-mining sector is lower levels of capacity utilisation than average, which means that if the business sees a bit of an increased demand, they don't go and buy a new machine, they just run the machine a bit harder. So we still worry that you're not going to get a big kick up in non-mining investment, which means domestic demand is going to struggle. And that's our sort of forecast going out for a couple of years. Now, the red line, which is GDP, is going to look fine. So it's going to look very much like ABEAR. It's, you know, it's 25 to 3%. Domestic demand is growing at 1%. And when domestic demand only grows at 1%, you don't generate enough jobs to basically keep the economy on equilibrium, particularly the unemployment rate. And there's our view about what's going to happen in unemployment. So we have unemployment continue to essentially track up to about 6.5% by the end of the year and then come down towards the end. Part of the come down towards the end is our assumption that um, something's going to happen. You can't have 6.5% unemployment and the government not doing anything. I think there'll also be uh, problems in terms of people giving up. So discourage worker effects. So in terms of rates, um, RBA, I think, is very comfortable. I don't think anybody's expecting them to do anything today or anything for the next six months. Um, as I said, what's really going to be the issue about what's happening to this non-mining investment, and if you're watching one thing for rates, watch the level of unemployment. Um, we have a... T we're a non-consensus view. Our non-consensus view is they do nothing for a long time and then maybe by the end of the year they have to cut rates once more. Um, most of the market has got them flat for a long time and, and doing nothing. So my final slide is there's always risk on the outlook. Um, I'll start on the positive side. The current kick up in activity could well be sustained. Um, you will get a strong GDP tomorrow, but again, remember you're getting probably about 0.7 out of exports tomorrow. So if you get a 0.9 sort of thing or one, you're not getting much in terms of domestic demand. Um, house prices, I think, could well stay up on the positive side. Inflation's been a bit higher than people have been expecting. If unemployment stays around the same levels, the RBA is done, and they'll be increasing rates early in 2015. The other risk could be that activity starts to fizzle out. We're not sure yet what confidence uh, effects have been from a lot of manufacturing uh, sort of levels of unemployment going up, announcements in Toyota, et cetera, Qantas, uh, Alkaya, you, you name it, there's been a lot. So that could cause some problems. 
unemployment could get worse than we all think. Um, from a statistical point of view, if I run a macro model that includes domestic demand as my main driver of employment, I get very high levels of unemployment. Um, and the mining investment could well fall faster than we think, and then there's the other risk about what's going to happen in the budget. My assumption is roughly the government's going to be neutral. I suspect they're going to be more than neutral. So I think that is a downside risk. So I might stop there, and uh, thank you.